public school. The ACI is a firm believer in, in protecting the integrity of the certification process and does not tolerate educator misconduct. In addition to being an adjunct professor, she is also an active member of the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development. I humbly ask the legislature for her favorable consideration of Dr. Cooper Nurse's appointment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Santos. We will now begin with Mr. Linetta, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman St. Augustine, uh, Senators. My name is Ray Linetta, or actually my, my real name is Rainy, Ray Linetta. Um, I come before you for um, reconfirmation into the uh, Alcoholic Beverage Control Board. Uh, I've been with the ABC board now for about six years, so this will be my fourth time to go before the senators for, um, for uh, acceptance as a, a board member. Um, I'm the president of uh, Moss 2 Consultants. Um, you have a copy of my um, biography, my resume, just about everything that, that I've done, so I, I don't need to go through that. You can, you can peruse through that yourself and see <clears throat> what I have um, accomplished as a uh, Guamanian um, living here and um, uh, contributing to our community. And so there's an entire um, uh, section in my packet that talks about my community service uh, to Guam. Uh, and and in, in terms of uh, not just Guam, but also in the Philippines, since I've been doing real estate uh, over there and doing some things um, internationally. Um, as, a, as an ABC board member for six years, um, I believe I've had a great time. We've accomplished a lot. Um, I'm serving currently as the chairman of the ABC board, and my, um, my motto for the board members, my fellow, fellow board members, is that we will um, uh, do what's right, and that we will ensure that we do not hamper uh, the capability of the business community. We will help them when we can, but um, we, we will work with the, um, the inspectors, and that if we find a business who think they can uh, go around the law, then we will spank them, and we will spank them hard. But in terms of businesses who um, are there to, to do what's right and to be part of the community, we will help them as much as we can. And so that, as the chairman, that has been um, my motto for, for the team. And, and a team we are, and we enjoy um, our meetings, we enjoy what we do, and that is why um, we want to continue to be uh, board members uh, and, and contribute to the island. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Jerry, did you wanna testify uh, in support of Mr. Lanetta? Hafidi, everyone. My name is Jerry Leon Guerrero. I'm a small business owner that has owned my business for over 13, 14 years. And I am currently sitting as the vice chairwoman for the ABC board. And I've been sitting in this position for two years. I'm here to um, give my short testimony in favor for Mr. Ray Lanetta, our chairman, and as well as Ms. Candy Okohama. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, you know, I've, since I've, I started, since I sat in this position over two years ago, uh, there were th certain things that I was, you know, quite unaware of, but through the guidance of Mr. Lanetta uh, and a very comprehensive knowledge with the inspectors of the ABC Compliance Board, uh, we were able to actually succeed in some of the missions and strategies that uh, the, the board had wanted to do to accomplish within the past two years. And one of them was um, do more inspections, or at least shadow the inspectors at in, uh, doing inspections, uh, do more compliance with regards to the, um, with uh, the establishments that have ABC licenses. And third is, is um, our, our inner board procedures. I think that we've squared away quite a few of uh, inconsistencies that have been done in the past. Um, all of our minutes and our agendas are very up to date and that has been one of the few things that's been notable within the inspectors is the fact that our, our, our paperwork and, and policies are 
up to par. And so I'm here to testify to say that if you folks would recon, you know, still consider Mr. Lanetta and uh, Ms. Candy Oklahoma uh, to sit on the board. Thank you. Candy. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman St. Augustine and fellow senators. I'm Candy Okuhama, and I currently serve on the Alcohol Beverage Control Board with Chairman Lanetta and Vice Chair Chairwoman Jerry. I was appointed in March 2017 for a two year term. Since then, my understanding and application of the ABC policies have allowed me to apply best, practice, best practices in our review process duties. While it's been a rewarding experience, I remain committed to serving with fairness and integrity that this position commands. It is my pleasure to serve another term on this board if given the opportunity. I thank the people of Guam and the le legislature for the confidence placed in me to serve in this capacity. Thank you. Um, as far as the process and the experience, but, uh, Chairman Lanetta and Vice Chairwoman pretty much has um, explained how we, um, um, our whole process of inspection and um, our meetings uh, for uh, application reviews. There's a lot of synergy between the three of us and it's been such an enjoyable working experience not just with the board member, but also with the ABC compliance staff. And I'm here asking for your reconsideration to extend my. Thank you. You already spoke, right, on her behalf? Yes. yes. Okay. Do any of my colleagues? Oh, before I start out, I apologize. I'd like to recognize my colleagues that have joined me. And I will start with my, the vice speaker on my far left would be Senator Therese Terlai then Senator Stavis, then we also have Senator Frank Ogden. We have on my far right would be Senator Luis Munia, and Senator Mary Torres, and Senator Mike Sinicholas. And I will ask my colleagues if any of you would like, uh, Senator Torres. Half a day. Um, Mr. Leonetta, you mentioned that you were very pleased with the progress of the ABC board and, and that you have conducted quite a few uh, investigate not investigations, but um, inspections of, of establishments. And I was wondering, in, in your assessment, uh, in sitting here in the legislature, we've had some testimony lately with regard to some of the practices in the establishments, the bar establishments. Um, we know that during your tenure, there were two laws that have been uh, changed, one with regard to the age of drinking, consumption of alcohol from 18 to 21 years, most recently, and the other was the, um, the, the, the hours of operation for the establishments. But, um, so in your estimate, do you think that, that, that compliance with those laws has not been an issue of late in your assessment? So, <clears throat> to answer your question, um, I believe the laws, um, the two laws that were recently implemented during my time have been effective. The issue uh, with the laws is the enforcement. I, I wanted to clarify that as board members, we, we do not inspect. We accompany the, um, the compliance officers and we um, observe. And um, as board members, we've, we've gone to a few of those for, so that we can understand what the inspectors go through and what's out there. We try uh, very much to push the inspectors out to do the compliance inspections. Unfortunately, in the past, we've had issues with not having enough manpower to do so. Um, but quite recently, uh, we've, we've received more manpower. So there will be more inspections in the past. Now, we can create laws uh, until we're blue in the face, but when you don't have the means to ensure that the laws are followed, then it's gonna be pandemonium out there. And so I think that's part of the issue that we've had in the past is that we create the laws, but then we don't have the manpower to go out there and enforce 
it and, and um, ping the businesses that are not following the laws. So point blank, the, the answer is um, I think things are going to get better because now we have more people to, to enforce the laws that the, that, the, that the legislature has created. That's good to hear because one thing that, I'm, that was also brought up most recently in, in hearings is that there, one of the, the reasons that many of these establishments are profitable is because they are unlawfully reselling products that are not intended for resale, specifically alcohol products that are not in the usual distribution line of, uh, of establishments on Guam that are, that are most likely purchased, for example, from the military exchanges that those products tend to end up on the shelves of bars and those are the products that are being sold. So they're, they're not, uh, you know, they, they, the establishments are, are unfairly using products that are not, um, that are attained at, a, at a, a lesser price, but more specifically are not intended to be resold. And so I, I want to bring that to your attention and to ask you if that is also one of the areas of concern because it undermines not only the, the profitability of legitimate businesses on Guam who distribute wines and spirits, but it, it, it goes against the, um, the uh, unauthorized resale of, of products on Guam. So is that an area that you're also aware of and that you, you plan to enforce? Point blank? Yes, the answer to your, to, your, to your question is that, yes, we are very concerned about that particular situation, but there, there are many situations out there. And for that particular one, I don't believe I've experienced um, um, the, the inspectors catching a business that has been reselling alcohol that was intended for the consumption of um, um, the military, basically, right, is, is, is what we're, we're talking about, where they... Yeah, uh, because what I'm talking about is, yeah. is products that are not sold by regular distributors on Guam right. that are only brought in through the military bases right. and are purchased and then sold at bars. And, and you know, that's my point, is it's, uh, it's kind of an underground practice, and, and right. those are the sorts of things that have been brought, have been testified here by right. some businesses uh, and, and clearly if we're going to make everything whole in terms of what is a, a product that is lawfully purchased and the taxes are paid accordingly um, that you know those also be captured in other ways through inspections for example by um, the authorizing boards such as yours so I just thank you very much for that well yeah I, I share I share the same concern that you have I've heard, I hear things just like you have. Unfortunately, we have not, uh, during my tenure, have caught a business doing that. But should we ever, I, I would recommend that we give the maximum penalty possible for, for those businesses that are trying to do things uh, against the law. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to reiterate that in the past, we've had issues with not having uh, sufficient numbers of compliance officers. And I've, I'm, I'm very confident, having the added bodies that we, we are now getting, that we, we, we will be out there. Part, part of our goal as a board is that quarterly, we want to accompany the inspectors, uh, compliance officers, so that we can, we can show that you know, we have a unified type of teamwork where the board, as well as the compliance inspectors, are out there, and that we are looking for, for we, not exactly we are looking, we want to ensure that people are following the law. And, 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 and we want to ensure that there are, there are means to, to do that, right? And that in the past, when we didn't have enough uh, people, we couldn't, we, couldn't get peop we couldn't get our inspectors out there. Now we can. Zeus Maasi. Thank you. Thank you. S Senator Frank. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Cooper Nurse, thank you for accepting the appointment by the, the reappointment by the Chief Executive and also uh, Ms. Yokohama, Mr. Lanetta. I have one, one quick question. You know, when I, I look at revenue tax, there are, the Chairman would be aware, maybe about three or, or four plus different boards and commissions 
within revenue tax, overseeing different components, whether it's uh, the beverage aspect. Now, from your perspective, operating with a small size board, would, do you see a need to reform and to see if there can be a general consolidation of these boards so that we can realize some efficiencies? In actuality, um, our board has discussed the possibility of us um, taking on the other uh, boards such as gaming and um, you know those other um, cockfighting you know uh, and we feel we can handle it uh, and and of course if there's any consolidation of boards and commissions it would be reflective of some of the required specialties specializations yes. in terms yes. of background experience so in this case it may be three individuals from the ABC board consolidated with some of two of the position requirements from another board so that in fact this government operates with greater efficiency and th to me why do we need four different five different boards overseeing different components within one agency we agree and and, and, and I see Jerry shaking her head and I think Candy also and that uh, we we've discussed this possibility and we're ready for it if it should ever happen and and we, we are w ready willing and able to do so thank you yes. Um, one one follow-on question. You mentioned that now you have more manpower to be able to ensure compliance with the law. So can you explain when you came in, you had how many personnel, and then now? We had one one supervisor, two inspectors, and one one person that was detailed to the to the um, organization. Correct. There was also a one contract worker, a limited term employee. Yeah. And so during our time. Uh, we, you know, although we planned that we wanted to do a quarterly inspections uh, to shadow the inspectors, we were only allowed to do two. And the reason is, again, it's because of short staff. Um, and the allotable amount of hours that the inspectors are given after five o'clock. And so, um, but during those two times, uh, the first time we were able to close, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we're proud to say it, but every establishment, on July 1st of 2017, we went to, uh, we shadowed to inspect, they closed it down for non-compliant. Uh, we did a recent inspection and I, I believe with the exception of one establishment, every other one had an infraction. Um, you know, I, I know it's, it's money in the coffers to say that we're generating revenue for those that have infractions, but, you know, as the Senator ad, uh, addressed earlier, that there's a lot of concerns that are coming towards the, the ABC Compliance Board. Um, again, there's a, there's a procedure. Someone needs to come in, file a formal complaint. Once they file a formal complaint, then the complaint gets brought over to the inspectors, do their due diligence, and then procedure after that. But if the complaints don't necessarily come in, you know, and, and again, then again, there's lack of inspectors. But recently, they picked up four. Um, and uh, so now they're able to train more. Uh, they're able to train so that the rest of the inspectors are allowed to go out now and start inspecting establishments. Okay, thank you very much. And there's one particular statement that you made a little earlier in your, in your comments. Yes. And you said, you know, we understand that this would generate revenues, but uh, without the infraction, you know, there, right. there more or less would not be any revenues as a result of violations. I think in this case, with ABC, if there's zero vi violations or zero infractions, that's the ideal situation. Because really the commission is, is, in my opinion, not in existence to be able to go out and collect money for the government. The commission is to ensure that, that there's compliance with the mandates and the laws right. and to ensure the safety and the health of our people out there in the community. Right. That's, the, that's the objective. So if you right. have zero infractions yeah. every single year, that would be an ideal situation. So I, yeah. I appreciate uh, your, your statements this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Stavis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Okuhama and um, Ms. Mr. Lanetta, just a question. Has there any been consideration or talks or research on, um, I guess, a practice in other jurisdictions of special uh, cabaret licenses um, that allow for extended hours for certain establishments that meet criteria? Um, is, has there been any, any talks or has that ever been brought up uh, to your commission? And if you can just, you know, maybe contribute to the conversation. 
Actually, yes, we've, we've, we've talked about the hotels. Yeah. yeah. And that uh, right now the law says uh, um, they start at 1.30, but 2 o'clock, boom, everything shuts down, no alcohol served, right? But um, the, the discussion was um, uh, the intent of that, that law and that um, in, in, with, with hotels, the situation might be a little bit different because you've got, you've got uh, not, not residents of Guam, but tourists coming in and, you know, they come from, they come from other places and, and you know, um, maybe allowing, allowing them uh, um, certain leeway to be able to purchase alcohol. I, and that's what we've discussed. Uh, we, we've not taken it any further by initiating a letter or a memo to, 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 to the legislature, but we're, we're discussing that. And um, it's sounding like it, it might make sense, right? And, and that would also be able to generate um, funds and help businesses uh, flourish. Yeah, and, and more business friendly, right? Uh, th thank you. Um, if there's anything else to add, I just wanted to, to see if you were, were looking up. I, there has been, uh, I think, talk in the past of allowing for that, considering that the main uh, tourist push or main tur the tourists that come from the region um, are used to, or at least in their recreational time, um, working and uh, spending their money in establishments that have uh, very long hours that are friendly. So I'm, I'm glad that you're looking into that, um, especially with the issues of financial uncertainty with the government moving forward. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you um, in the future to discuss that further. I, I wanted to add, because I'm, I think this is going to come back to the legislature, that there are safety nets involved with allowing um, uh, some kind of leeway for the, the two o'clock law. Um, basically allowing tourists to come in uh, and, and with the understanding that tourists normally come in, they don't have a vehicle, so that they're not going to go out there and drink and drive. You know, they're coming from different locations and that um, in order for them to buy alcohol, they, they, they must show that they are um, checked in at the hotel, on that particular hotel, not any other hotel, but the, the hotel that they're staying in. So, you know, if, if it makes sense to allow uh, hotels uh, in particular to sell to, to tourists uh, alcoholic beverages, for me, I think it makes, it makes sense. And it does not go against the original law of the intent to not allow uh, residents to purchase alcohol beyond two o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Le Lynetta, Ms. Uh, Okama, um, your sentiments on, on the conversation? Well, we definitely had the conversation and it's still in discussion. And we were def the discussion includes putting provisions, like Chairman Lynetta mentioned, was to include just a tourist having a room key present, uh, at present when you're at the bar area and there, we were thinking of other, there were more other discussions involving how to generate re revenue. So everything right now is just still in the discussion stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do any of my colleagues would like to ask, uh, Vice Speaker? Ma'am? Okay, and then you be next. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, thank Ms. Santos and Ms. Langaro for their testimony in support of these nominees. And um, Ms. Cooper Nurse, I want to thank you for your willingness to serve on this board. On top of your duties as a principal, I am sure you're very, very busy and um, that this board also takes a lot of time and dedication. Um, and I just wanted to comment that I really appreciated your reminding us about your priorities and that they include ensuring the safety of the children in part, as part of your duties on this board. So thank you very much for that. As for the ABC board, um, thank you all. You bring us very good news about the enforcement and uh, I think all the businesses want to hear that that's being done, that, that it's being done fairly. So I appreciate you going out with the enforcement officers to ensure that and, and to be able to report firsthand what you've seen and how you think it's working. And the recommendations that might be forthcoming, and we welcome that. Um, Ms. Mr. Yaneta, can I just ask for the record, I think I asked um, Ms. Okuhama when, in her last appointment hearing, but in your company, 
um, Moss too? Who are the shareholders? Myself, my wife, and my daughter. Okay, and uh, it's a consulting company. Do you have any clients who are restaurants or bars? No. Right. Um, we focus on um, construction, architecture, engineering, business to business. Uh, all of my clients are off island. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for your service. Uh, it, your board also is going to take a lot of work. So, Sisus Masi. Senator Snickers. Sir, you have any questions? Okay. There being no further question, for Dr. Cooper Nurse, thank you for accepting your, your reappointment. We really appreciate it because I know you do a lot of work with Ms. Santos. She, she, she has a habit of keeping people busy in that commission. But I do thank you. Um, for the two ABC members, uh, Jerry's appointment will be coming in real soon, so she'll be back on the table, and I expect both of you to come and testify on her behalf. But on the issue of the consolidation of these uh, commissions, for my colleagues, just to let you know that I, it, it is in draft form to consolidate the ABC, the cockpit, the gaming, and the boxing as one. And yes, exactly what Senator Elgin brought up, um, basically, some of the expertise that the ABC board members have will meet the requirements for the gaming and the boxing. So, so we can expect that forthcoming, hopefully before this term ends. And then on the issue of dealing with the alcohol at the hotels, the hotel industry has approached me, and I, the chairman here uh, and I go back a long time, because I was, used to be the supervisor when we didn't have that many inspectors, but we did what we could. But the, the hotel industry has approached us to ask to ex expand, extend the hours from two to basically beyond even four. And the reason for that is because you have airlines that come in at two, three o'clock in the morning and the guests have nowhere to go. And, and um, they're asking is if they can have that privilege. I said, we will work with the ABC board and come up with the mechanism and the protection from, our, from the community from anybody going out and driving around drunk. Because I just hate to see the uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers coming after the list. They're just saying, we allowed it. We want to make sure all these parameters are in place. But other than that, I thank you all for accepting your reappointment and uh, actually be asking and hoping for my colleagues to support uh, your, your, your confirmation on, on the June's uh, session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. There being no one else to testify on their behalf, the committee will continue to receive testimony for the next couple of days. And please address your written testimony to the Committee on Education, Finance, and Taxation. Submit it via email to Senator Joe S. Sanogsin at gmail.com. My office located at Rand Care Building, second floor, suite 3761, South Marine Corps Drive, the morning, Guam. We will now proceed with we got a good number of bills, ladies and gentlemen. We will start with um, Bill 287, introduced by myself, an act to amend Section 3101 to add new Section 3101 to amend 3101C1 to add a new Section 3118, all of Article 1, Chapter 3, Title 16, Guam Code annotated to specify forms of identification accepted for real ID license to require surrender of foreign license at the end of 30 days to provide for all violent remote renewal license. And that will be followed by Bill 264, correction, 270. That bill will follow, but we will start with uh, Bill 287. And the folks we have listed here would be Mr. Camacho, Ms. Benito, Mr. Jesse Salas, and Mr. Anthony Oka. All revenue and tax folks. Great. Conduct of the public hearing as we continue to all the bills, ladies and gentlemen, will be conducted in this format. Those testifying will be recognized in the order of sign up on the sign in sheet. 
Written testimony may be read. Lengthy written testimony should be sum summarized to about five minutes. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide our legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony shall be confined to the substance. Persons will be allowed to present oral testimony only once. Once you are done, you may be asked to remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony, as may be desired by the members of the panel. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. And please state your name. We will begin with Mr. Camacho, the Director of the Department of Revenue and Tax. Sir. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman uh, of the Committee, uh, Senator Dos San Agustin, uh, members of the committee. My name is John P. Camacho. I'm currently the Director of the Department of Revenue and Taxation. I'm here uh, to test, uh, testify in support of uh, uh, Bill 287. The initial impl implementation of the Real ID Act began in 2008. Since 2011, DRT has been challenged with complying with the numerous federal requirements. This bill is another step closer to being Real ID compliant by enacting lag language in a local driver's license law to mirror the Real ID documentation requirements by, by the federal law. DRT is targeting, good news, DRT is targeting to go live on June 25th, which is like 20 days from now, to be Real ID compliant, and we're closing a finger that will meet that requirement. Federal programs such as the Real ID Act are difficult to deploy because of the stringent requirements of security, both physical and systemic. Effective procedures, policies, and processes are all critical tasks to ensure the safeguard of the information that DRT collects. In the Real ID implementation, we have to comply with three different federal agencies. One, the State Homeland Security. Second, Social Security Administration. And lastly, is the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, which is normally called AMVA. As you can imagine, it was a huge task. With your favor favorable support, we look forward to providing the citizens of Guam a real ID compliant driver's license for Guam identification and Guam identification. This will enable them to travel, enter federal installations or buildings, and give them the confidence that their ID is protected with the increase of ID theft today the enhanced security features provide all minimum, will, will minimize the prevent real ID theft. Thank you for this opportunity to submit this testimony and we're open. I have uh, the director here and, um, and Jesse Salas and uh, senior staff, Tony Oga. Thank you, sir. Ms. Benito. Hi, Th half a day. Thank you, Mr. Chair, half a day senators. I'm here in support of this bill. As you're all aware, and the community, we've been trying to go into um, real ID compliant. But as the director mentioned in his testimony, we've had a lot of challenges going into that because of the federal requirements that had to be met. We're at the tail end of this requirement now. In fact, we have the SSA Coordinator is coming out next week and for the review on how we're doing as far as, as far as meeting the requirements. And we brought the staff, Jesse Salas, the supervisor, and Tony, he was the POC in putting this together the past year. So it's been a real challenge and we're at the tail end of this now and this will, this will um, solidify that we are heading in that direction as far as the compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salas or Mr. Oka, do you, do, would you like to testify about, about this bill? Because you, I know the two of you were the one that actually helped my staff put this bill together. So would you like to say anything about the bill? Because I think the people of Guam would like to know what are some of the benefits. And my colleagues would like to know what are the benefits. Sure. <laughs> Tell you. us about it. Yes. Yeah. Sell this Thank bill to my colleagues. All right. Okay. I, I do support the bill too, which is Bill 287, and, and it is a good bill. It, it's, uh, yes, there is a lot of work to it, and uh, a, a lot of people are complaining about supporting documents. However, with these supporting documents, this will help us in place a better system and um, 
and for co of course the ID itself, if they're going to be using it in federal offices or traveling, they're for sure that is whatever, whoever we issue the ID that we did our part as far as the process of an individual when they're out there using this ID. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Chairman, Senators, my name is Anthony Oka. I am in support of this bill. This bill will definitely help the people of Guam as far as making sure that no licenses are duplicated or counterfeit. The license that we'll be issuing out <clears throat> has security features in it that ANVA has uh, created. The documents that we are requesting from the people are documents that will let us know they are lawfully here on this island. The lawful status that requires for us to verify. To verify that they are in fact a U.S. citizen or a non-U.S. So this bill definitely will help this island as far as making sure that they are here legally. Thank you. Director, Deputy Director, would you like to add additional comments before I ask my colleagues if they want any questions? In reference to, you know, we have uh, a few bills that, that have been introduced that talked about the automatic voter registration, that this would meet that requirement because you would identify who's a U.S. citizen and who's non and who can be automatically. Could you yes. please testify on that behalf? Thank you for reminding me about that, Mr. Chair. I, um, yes, there's a, two bills, I believe, that are out there. Number one is the motor voter and then the automatic um, registration. So that will absolutely, with this bill and the requirements of the real ID, we need to identify the uh, U.S. citizens. So this will help move that forward. And we would like to start identifying, really, um, ident um, citizenship. And that, is, that will be done with the real ID. And the motor voter, I know that we're working towards that also with the same vendor. And part of the process is moving that data electronically and not manually like, like what we're doing right now, which is manual. We're working on moving that electronically. Okay, thank you. Does any of my colleagues, Senator Rogan, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for uh, the statements today, because in terms of personal identification theft, it's a major issue nowadays. And if this is certainly going to contribute towards ensuring the security of our people and their ID so that no one steals uh, their identity, then by all means, uh, that's certainly going to be very helpful. Quick question. From 2008, Mr. Director, you mentioned uh, you started this process in 2008 to today. What has been the investment by the people of Guam? on trying to stand up the real ID program? I, I don't know the, the exact numbers, uh, Senator, but I know that we, we got some grant money uh, from um, Homeland Security. I'm not, yes, yes, I just don't know the, the amounts. We can get back to you as far as the amounts that we put into this, this uh, real ID. I, I think my deputy said a little bit over $2 million. So a little over $2 million, yes. and, and all those federal funds have been exhausted? It's been exhausted. Yes, it's been exhausted, and basically we're, we're uh, paying uh, yeah, now out of our budget right now. I think uh, recently we've been paying uh, some of the costs. Is there a, an additional opportunity to pursue federal grants? Because obviously this is a federal mandate. They provided seed money of about $2 million. So are there opportunities to be able to pursue additional federal grants for the maintenance of the system and the process? Yeah, I, I guess that's something that we can explore, Senator. I think we can uh, work with uh, our counterparts and uh, I see if there's some opportunities to, to get grants to uh, continue the maintenance of these, these uh, programs. And you said that this is going to be stood up by the 25th of June? Now, yes. The, like the Berpi said, I think we're having some people come, come in uh, between now and, and the 20th. 
uh, people from Social Security Administration that will be coming in to see our, our program, then people from our valet, our, our, our contractor that's coming in to do the final touch, the, you know, polish the, the, uh, the program, then hopefully if everything goes well, we should go live on the 25th. Yeah. I guess my, and I'll just close, close with this, Mr. Chairman, I guess my concern is, is looking at the consumers. Are people who actually come to Revent Tax and procure a driver's license? From that perspective, are there any additional requirements other than what has been in the system and required over the course of the last year or two years? I mean, in terms of the process, documentation? Well, uh, I think we've, we've, been, we've been asking uh, the, uh, the applicants to, to submit the requirements if they, they choose so some of these um, are people that are applicants that came, came in during the period that we started this process did in fact uh, submit all the requirements. So once they're vetted, uh, they, they don't have to come in and, and show proof unless that, that certificate or identification expired some before the renewal. So in other words, if everything is submitted, the, the identity, which is the birth certificate or valid passport or the the uh, social security uh, card or, or within the last five years, they presented something like the W-2 or 1099, uh, or the third one basically is for the proof of residency if they, come, if they came in and submitted their, their uh, proof of, uh, let's say, a billing for, for the real property tax or, for the, or even for the, from the mayor's office, verification from the mayor's office, within the last 30 days, any two of those options that are available, they don't have to actually come in unless something changed in their status, so like they I, get married or something. So Mr. Camacho, can I just suggest that Revent Tax go back out to the community, if you're gonna stand up the system, possibly on the 25th of June, and go back and remarket this program, reminding our people that these are some of the additional requirements. I would hate to see some of our people come in within that last week to get their driver's license, and then they're gonna be penalized of, with a fee if in fact they come in a week before, and they're instructed you have to go get all these documentation, but because they're working, they're not able to get it within a certain number of days, and it carries over to the next month. And then they're penalized because our government did not provide sufficient timelines and information. So can I just make that suggestion so that our people understand that when this is stood up, then these are your requirements and you have to be able to comply with them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for Thank that, you. Senator Thank Rebo. Thank you. Thank you. Senators, does... Senator Nelson, you have? Okay. One second. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Um, you know, the, it, historically, within this term, there has been much confusion about the real ID requirements and the driver's license requirements. And I distinctly remember we've had a round table uh, last year, and some of the concerns were raised were that, in fact, the real ID was not even a requirement, that, but we went ahead and imposed it on the people. We made it a part of a policy and procedure, which could have had a, a direct link to why the lines are so long when people wanted to renew their driver's license. So they were waiting for eight hours or more. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I'm trying to connect the dots here and trying to understand what is the, the purpose of this bill really because first uh, we, un, we imposed this real ID requirement when it, for people who wanted to renew their driver's license. And then we said, oh, wait a minute. It's not required, the, some of the things that you're asking that DRT was asking for from the people. And now we're coming back and we're entertaining this bill with, again, um, additional requirements. And, and I'm trying to look at the law because essentially you're, you're changing a lot of sections within the law. And some of the requirements is um, a W-2 or 10, 1099 within the past five years, official taxpayer transcripts. So, I'm trying to think, are you doing this uh, as an unfunded mandate or are you doing this because we're looking to receive more money from the federal government? Because the title of the bill is, is rather confusing to what the content of the bill states because the title of the bill addresses real ID license to require surrender a foreign, foreign license at the end of 30 days to provide for off-island remote renewal of licenses. 
But then we go down and we address all the other sections of renewing a regular driver's license and so forth. So perhaps what, what is the real purpose or why are we really doing this bill for the Real ID Act because of the confusion it has done in the past? And are we looking to benefit? Well, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll answer that question. What this bill is, is to make sure that by law, we can collect these documents, and that will definitely show the um, Homeland Security the, that we are moving towards being Real ID compliant. We'd like to go there to benefit the, the community. We were talking about ID theft earlier. These are features that are already on the driver's license and Guam ID, and in order to make sure that you are who you are, we need to collect these documents. And it's one time. It's only going to be the initial um, first time that you submit it. After that, you're already in the system. All the documents have been collected. And to address the eight-hour lines, that, you know, I, I think that was a good program for us because it showed us what our weaknesses were. And because of that, we were able to open up the satellite and hopefully with this, implementing this, making everybody real ID compliant, um, and then we have the satellite going on, and those people that already previously submitted in the past, as we mentioned before, we'll, we're not going to, they, they've already been vetted, we don't need those documents unless there was a change, like let's say the passport expired, then all we need is a passport. But other than that, we're not going to require the documents again. So this will make sure that we get the documents we need to, again, solidify your identity. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Director, pressure, uh, thank you. I, I know the deputy mentioned the passport. That's if it's a foreign passport, not a, not a U.S. passport, just right. to, to clear for that. Right. But it says license in the foreign license in the bill. Um, why do we want to appease Homeland Security? You said that we're trying to prove to Homeland Security something. What is the, what, what, what are we trying to prove with Homeland Security, show them we're compliant? Why, why is this necessary? These documents are, are part of the requirements. So in order, I mean, we need to tell them that, you know, by law, yes, now we're required to submit them. And the, I, I believe prior to this, it's not, it's not in our laws. Is the federal so, government requiring all states and territories to do this? Is this, a, is this a federal government law that you must comply as, all, as states and territories? Are if, they requiring that? Uh, yes, if, if you, if you want to get a real ID compliant um, driver's license. Okay, or, no, I'm not asking about real ID if I want to get it. I'm asking is the federal government requiring all states and territories to have this real ID requirement? Are we going to lose any money because of it? Are we going to be put in some kind of blacklist because of it? Well, um, what happened was this was already initiated in 2008. So when we came in, the grant money was already given, was already spent. So all we did was move forward and try to comply with it. So it was approved prior to this, and now we're just moving it forward. I see. So you received grant money in 2008. Yes, yes. Right. And we used that grant money. Did we yes. spend that grant yes. money to implement all $2 million of it? Did we spend that to implement Real ID? Yes. We used it to. Yes, And correct. so because somehow in some authority someone received this money, now we have to make this a law and put this burden on the people. It's not really or a the burden. The extra requirement. Okay. It's for a Real ID. Some of these requirements were already there on your first time driver's license, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's not, it's the renewal that's different. Yes. But first time driver's license, these were all required. Right. So now we're only looking at renewal. So how many people are we looking to renew? We're talking about people. How many thousands of people are back, still, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right. please, please don't take no, it no, as disrespect. No, I understand what you're saying. Okay. How many people before this uh, we're going to have to go back and do the map, um, do look at the research and run the numbers. But as of 2011, so when if I want to renew it? my ID, I have to because I, I haven't met the real ID requirements yet. If I want to renew my ID, I need to comply with if with the real ID requirements because I'm the first time to renew. Correct. 
So my question is, how many people are in my, my position as well? well and I'm I don't have the numbers, but that's a good question. More than, I, yes. I, you know, I mean. <laughs> right, but we've been implementing this, and we implemented it since 2011, the documents. Right. So I, it's I, just the renewal. The, the new is already automatic. No, you I, have to provide these. And so I'm just wondering, renewals. Yeah, I'm wondering how many it's going to impact, because I, I can't remember the last time. My, my, my knee is renewed already. But since 2011, I, I never submitted these real ID requirements. So I'm wondering how many people are, are on the same boat as I am. And so essentially, it will have to impact them. And it didn't answer the next question was, are we receiving additional money? Or is this going to be also an, a requirement of our government or for the people to, to, um, to have to pay for? I guess in the most simplest terms. Yes, that, that grab was ex exhausted. So this is coming out of our budget now. And I just wanted for the record that you did say that all of the money for to meet the real ID requirements back in 2008 was specifically spent for the yes. real ID requirements? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tulay, did you have a question? We're going to work our way to my right. Thank you. All right. At the, at the last round table that we had, um, you made it clear that Real ID was an option for the recipients, I guess. So, for example, I could choose to go get a real ID or just to go and get a regular driver's license. Is that still correct? I, I, I believe the, uh, the federal law gives that option. Uh, it, it's just something that we, um, we, you know, we thought about it. And when we drafted this law with the senator, this is something that we want to make sure that you know um, that uh, these documents, if 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 somebody wants to come in and renew um, their license or their their ID, that we vet these documents, and uh, that's something that we, we we need we we can discuss uh, maybe as part of this bill. That if if something if you guys want to make it an option, that we can we can do that because the federal law does say there's an option. All right, but this bill, you agree that this bill now would make it mandatory that everybody yes. is submitting um, yes. all the documents necessary to get a real ID. Right. And, um, and that's actually the only, looks like, driver's license that you will be issuing after this is passed. Well, I, I think it, it, it applies to either. So either the Guam ID, if you, if you, if you can't drive or you, know, you need a Guam ID. Guam ID can, or yes. a driver's license. A driver's license, yes. yes. That it's all going to be like real ID compliant. Right. No more option. Well, yes, that's, that's what we have presently now, yes. All right. And then um, uh, oh. but um, you also explained at the last round table that we only need a real ID if we don't have, uh, we need it to travel if we don't have a passport. Isn't that correct? If I have a passport, I can travel without a real ID. Yes. All right. And um, so, because we're not the immigration system, I mean, the benefit to Guam, I guess, going forward is, um, yeah, I guess that's what we're trying to figure out, right? And, and well, so it would make it convenient for people maybe who travel without a passport often, mm -hmm. or it would make it convenient for people who go on and off base without a passport often. But for everyone else, it, it's, it's requiring, it looks to me, and now you told the senator that it's requiring the same things that you currently require, but I don't remember... Are really, this whole list is what you are currently requiring for a regular driver's license? No, right? These are additional, these are additional documents that need to be submitted. Isn't that correct? Because these are all being put into law because they're not currently required. Isn't that the case? It, it is required right now. However, it's not in the statute as far as the documents. But this is to assure that we require this now to go along with the real ID. 
No, I mean, to go forward for with the real ID, but, but under our current law, to get a driver's license, do I need to submit this entire list of documents? Uh, not, not on renewals. No, right? But first-timers, yes. When you're coming in to renew, you, you don't need to show us your passport, that you, your passport has been validated or is expired. But I don't remember submitting a mayor's verification for my driver's license. Uh, not, not with the mayor, but the, the documents So tell are, me exactly which ones are not currently required and which ones are new requirements. Well, the new requirement is, is yes, the mayor. And, and we do require that from the very beginning when we took over for the Guam ID for the processing and the issuance of a Guam ID is from the beginning of the process, we did require the mayor certification for residency when, you, when you're applying for the Guam ID. However, on the driver's license, it was never required. And up to this day, we, we did, did away with the requirement as far as the, the uh, mayor certification for renewals of driver's license. Unless they bring it in and submit it, then we'll go ahead and vet it. But requiring it is not a required for renewal. And so yes, some people are, are, are coming in with, with the certification and we do, we do take it and vet these documents. Because I could swear we just had that round table and we've just finished assuring the people that we were not going to mandate the real ID and that they could get a driver's license under the, the original statute, right? And because the requirements were different. I, uh, I guess, um if that's the uh, option that we're looking at, you know, I think we have to, to have some provision on this bill if this bill were to move forward. Um, yeah, yeah, this bill looks like no more option. Yeah. This is a mandatory. Yeah. Everyone is converted and everyone must submit all so, these, this whole list of documents. In other words, if, the, if it's the body's um, desire to put an option, then we need to, to uh, add some options into the bill. All right, could I ask you about this? Uh, there's one provision here re allowing for off-island remote renewal of, of a real ID license, right? A real ID driver's license, a real driver's license. The if, new driver's if license. Re if renewing by, by remote, uh, then we're not able to issue a real ID. Uh, the applicant would have to be, however, we can still renew the driver's license as the way we're re renewing it right now. So but what's the bill going to do? It, it's, it's giving them at least two times to renew it, uh, but after the third time, they need to come in and, sub, and, and submit the, uh, the requirements. Yes, in for person. The, uh, yeah, so in it, person. It, it allows kind of a, you can renew on off-island, it says, but it means online, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I was going to ask you. Does it, do not, we even not online, Not online, but, but submit it by mail, off-island. By mail? By mail, um, yes. And you're going to prove that the mail was sent from off island? Is that how you, how do you know they're off island versus on island? Uh, we have on our website the application and the applicant would, would uh, comp yes, complete and, and follow the instruction on the application. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, you just stated earlier that the documents required would be for new driver's license. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But um, as I'm reading the bill, page one, page two, item two, it says for new or renew renewals of a driver's license. Which, which one is it? Or is it an and or, or an or, or one specific? Can, can you? Like the director mentioned earlier, there's some documents that do expire, uh, like a uh, passport, for example, if a person is coming from out of Guam and uh, they're a non-U.S. citizen. I, I understand, but to my question, you, you had just said that the required documentations are for new licenses. No, um, no it's for new and renewal. New and renewal. Yes. Okay, let's yeah. be clear, uh, yes. because it, it, yeah. the, I think it was stated that that was for okay. new. So every single time they renew their driver's license, they have to bring all these but, documentations. No, no, no. You only, be, you only have to bring it in once to be vetted. Uh, so, that's not how I'm reading. Requires the following documents for new or renewal driver's licenses. These disprove the identity, and it goes down the list. So, I mean, I heard the statement, but what I'm trying to understand is why the law reads differently. It says for new or renewals of driver's license or permits, 
this is the required proof of identity. So I'm just trying to figure out which one is it. Is it for new? Is it for renewal? Or is it every single time? I, I think what we're trying to say, um, I, I know where you're coming from, but I, I think once you're vetted into the, uh, the system, we, we have all these um, documents vetted into our system, that you, it, it, it basically remains until there's a change of status. That if you come in for the second time to renew your driver's license and, and you see that everything is, is fine. M or Mr. Mr. Camacho, I, I, I was going to say I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I, I actually do. What we're discussing here is the bill as it's written um, because there's not going to be any changes. This is how it's going to be presented on the session floor. And then following that, if it is passed, then this is going to be this your guiding statute. So what, what, we, what I need to know here before moving forward or di discerning my support or intention for this bill as to whether or not it's a complete product. Because what you're telling me is not what it's saying within the language of the bill that I, that I have before me. And what I, what I need to know is that the intention that they submitted the documents on the first time they get their real ID and have a requirement to report any changes in documentation thereafter? Or is it the intent that they bring all of this documentation every single time they renew their license? What, I'm waiting, for, I'm looking for an answer. The intent is the first time either new or renewal. That's Thank you. And, and again, you know, I, I'll get a request from, from our legal counsel, but I don't believe it reads as such. Um, I think, you know, considering that we're, we're considering statute, I think it should be very clear. Um, my next question, I, to page four, this new section that's being added, uh, section 3118 off island remote renewal and driver's license licenses. Um, in terms of this language here, the, the number of with regards to off island renewals, so the page is not numbered, but I'll say about line 10. Off island renewal is valid for two renewals. Uh, where did that, that number come from? Is that uh, with regards to federal statute, as to limitations in renewals, or is that something? Um, a brainchild of revenue and taxation, or? With this two renewals, it's pretty much, we comparing ourselves with a lot of the state right now as far as remote renewals, uh, having to uh, renew your driver's license from the auto state or for auto Guam. So we're kind of marrying those process uh, as far as renewing the license. Uh, the, Understandable, you know, you know, and and I want to be make sure that we're we're really considering the process here because as I'm reading this, you know, especially considering Guam has the highest rate of service per capita. Yes, we have many off island military members. Yes, how does this apply to them? How can they be physically present we, on the third renewal? We we do have a, on the statute as far as uh, individuals that are active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces that the license remains valid. Uh, as far as that person is active duty, as active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces. Now, uh, understandable, but are you saying that, yes, even their expired license remains active, but we're not allowing them a means to renew? To renew. I mean, because I think that could be problematic. Our laws might say that a driver's license is invalid, is valid, even though it has an exp expiration date. However, if serviceman A is somewhere else, and there's an ex expiration on their driver's license, the law enforcement of that state might not honor that. And so I think it, it might be in their interest to want to renew their license, pay the fee to the government of Guam and be able to do that, but we're not affording them the opportunity in this, in this um, bill or in the process. Is, is that something that, that you're doing with intent or is that something that we might be able to improve upon the, the bill as it's written to consider? Yeah, so, we, we, Mr. we can. Mr. Salas, hold on. Yeah. I think what I think what is quite apparent that some of my colleagues don't. You haven't answered yet, director and deputy director. If you all will pull up 3101, you will find that what this bill did was include something that doesn't exist. What the department and the people of Guam were providing, it was never required. 
Do we understand that? Are, are we understand that, right? The reason why this bill was written, so when the people of Guam come up to get a driver's license, even today, there's nothing in the statute that mandates them to bring anything. That's why this bill was written. So as Senator Stevens and Senator Nelson and Senator Tully and everybody else actually believes, this bill actually creates a requirement so that the Department of Revenue and Tax, when they ask, when you come up as a new or a renewal, you, they will have the authority to say, bring me your passport or social security. Because today, if you look at the statute, my colleagues, there's nothing. There is nothing in the statute. And that's what I'm worried about is that we didn't have the statute and this bill would add the requirements because exactly what I think Senator Talai you mentioned, when I got my driver's license back in the 60s, I didn't have a requirement to even bring my social security. All I had to do was show up and they looked at me and said, you're Joseph Nelson. I filled in the application over the Guam Police Department. I got my driver's license. I never had a requirement, even as a police officer, to bring in my social security, my passport, any of that stuff, because the law never required it. Coincidentally, the Real ID Act, which unfortunately, I wish you would explain it, it is a, it is a, federal, a federal option so that if any of the, the people of Guam want to go into a federal installation, you must have either a passport or a Real ID. If you want to travel anywhere domestically, which is the United States, you must have a passport or a real ID. When you arrive in the States and they pull you over with a Guam driver's license, they may not recognize that driver's license. You may have some problems if you don't have a real ID driver's license. So I think that's what you should have been explaining. Because the question they're asking is really what I'm, talk what I'm saying now. Okay, so we'll continue on. And you find that the code is missing a lot of parts. Ladies and gentlemen, this code was written, I think, before some of you here were born. I was probably a young man then, but most of you weren't born. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I do understand, right? And, but at your level of government, you do have the opportunity either through the AAA process or even just standard practices, rules and regulations, standard operating procedures, that you can address these and have that flexibility if needed to address issues like types of documentation accepted. How do you handle a military member off island? How do you handle somebody in the hospital? And different things that you have the flexibility as the executive branch to be able to handle. But seeing as how we are now putting this into statute, um, really, you know, before I see this come to the session floor, I really hope at least the issues that I brought up and my colleagues brought up are addressed in the bill because we're not talking about adjusting a standard operating procedure on something that we might have slipped up on or something that we might have forgot. We're talking about passing a law here and telling the people of Guam that, yes, we came together as a government and these are now the requirements because it's very embarrassing to all of us if we're wrong or don't have it right. So. You know, at least that, that was my last thing, really. How, how are we going to address military service members? Um, because those are issues, like if, if, if I was off island serving and my Homer record is on Guam, my taxes are paid on Guam, I should be able to renew my license on Guam. But if you're telling me now you're not going to provide me a legal means to do it, um, I think there's, there, there are some problems there. Um, so... Um, again, uh, thank you for the opportunity and your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think there are, is a lot of work that still needs to be done, and hopefully it gets worked on in committee before, uh, and, and to be presented before the legislature before it, it hits the session floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And Senator Snickers, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I first want to contextualize. I think a lot of the, the questions and concerns come from the fact that we rolled out the real ID and then it created all this havoc, and a lot of our people are just really averse to it. And so there's a, a need now at the policy level for us to very clearly um, understand why the real ID is something that we need to convert to. And I think some of my colleagues earlier established that, one, it's not a requirement by the federal government. We have the option to implement it. 
And I think that's an, imp um, an important place for us to start from. And so if we're going to implement it then, it being optional, um, we very clearly either decide, yes, that's something we want to do and accept all of those hurdles that are going to come with it, or no, those hurdles are just not worth our time. And so some, of the, some points that came up over the course of the conversation today was one, we got grant money for this to implement it. If we don't implement this, will we need to pay that grant money back? It's either yes or no, ma'am. Is it a yes or no? Do we need to pay back the grant money from 2008 that unfortunately was not used to fully implement the Guam, the real ID that should I, have been introduced I, by the legislature back then? I, I certainly don't have that answer, but I can definitely look into it and get back to you, Senator. I think it's a critical question because if we've already expended funds that are all of a sudden going to create a liability for us, then it really makes us have to say, okay, there's a cost to this decision. If the answer is no, we don't need to pay it back, and I'm kind of I'm kind of leaning more towards that probably being the answer because we, we've shut it down, right? We stood it up with that grant money and then we shut it down, we're back to the, the regular ID right now, right? I mean, if we can turn it off, then that means that, if we can turn it off without tr triggering the need to pay it back, then that probably means that we don't need to, but I'll, I'll wait for the, the, official, the official answer. And so as I think about the real ID, um, and I listen to what some of the benefits are, contextualizing it with how we have our realities here on Guam, if we got the real ID, would I be able to fly to Hawaii without a passport? Yes. I would be able to go from a, US, from a Guam airport into a U.S. airport without a passport. Yes. Our, our international airport that's outside of the U.S. customs zones, we would not need to bring our passport with us anymore. So we wouldn't need a passport to travel domestically. Domestic, yes. Now I want you guys to be very, very clear of that answer because Guam is not a, considered a domestic destination. It's considered an international destination. And so I need you guys to be 100% certain that if we had, if I just took my real ID to go and fly out of here, I'd be able to go uh, and use that without a passport because I'm still, I'm, I'm not, getting any kind of concrete responses, at least in my research. Um, so that's something that needs to, be, needs to be made very, very clear. Would this kind of bypass the need for, for a passport? Um, and those are the two questions, I think, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that are, are very important, because if we still need a passport to fly into a U.S. destination, initially from Guam, then we're going to have our passports on us anyway. And it becomes almost repetitive to have a um, another identification that the passport would already satisfy the need for if we're already needing that anyway to travel out of Guam and into Hawaii or into any other direct U.S. destination. So if we can get those two answers, like a, a firm um, answer on the record for that, that'll be great. Okay, can I, I, I'd like to answer the second one, can we use it to travel? The answer is yes, and that's a affirmative yes because we've also communicated with Homeland Security, the vendors that have done this. Um, we've, we've been doing this for eight years now, and we would not implement something that is not going to benefit you know, the, the taxpayer or the public. So yes, the answer is yes. We don't need a passport to travel if you have the real ID compliant driver's license. The only reason why I'm really hammering on the question is because I believe if you travel domestically in the United States, like let's say from California to Nebraska, you don't need a passport to do that domestically within the, the contiguous United States, or I, I, th I believe even from like um, from the, the non-contiguous states, but from Guam, from our specific status as a territory, that's different. Um, that's the reason why when we go to Hawaii, we need to bring our passports with us. So I just don't want like some low-level official saying, oh, yeah, no, it's not going to be a problem, only, or it's not, I'm sorry, if you get that, then yeah, you're, you're, you're off the hook, only come to find out later that our people are jumping through all these hurdles to get the real ID, and they still need their passport to at least get into the first port um, point of entry. So if we can just really have an airtight answer on that, uh, I'd very much appreciate it. Aside from um, serving as a... Um, uh, if those two hurdles are cleared, um, then that's something that we, we really need to look at. If we do need to pay that money back, that's something that needs to be, be, be carefully considered. 
And so uh, I, th I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to ask the questions, and I look forward to the responses so that we can um, weigh it with respect to the bill. I also um, just wanted to note, though, that the Chairman is correct in that if we don't move forward with the real ID, we're still going to need a separate piece of legislation to, to require documentation, proper documentation, for at least the initial application of the, uh, of the Guam driver's license, because right now it's still not a mandate, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. S S Senator Moon? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to just comprehend and, and take in all the questions that have already been previously asked, which really was a lot of my questions. But um, I'm not sure uh, Senator St. Nicholas was talking about uh, travel. And the way I understand it, because we are uh, U.S. citizens, uh, we, nece we don't necessarily need a passport to travel to the United no. States. Um, just a birth certificate, right? We do need a passport, though, in order to travel foreign. to any of our foreign uh, countries. So that real ID would apply to the foreign countries as well, too. No. And we would have a no. No. Okay. No. You still need a passport. Strictly U.S. Yeah. Just strictly U.S. Right. So we would still need to have our passport, like Senator to, to Sinclair said, foreign. to travel foreign. to the foreign Correct. countries. Okay. Um, if you can just take me back to uh, 2008, before we even accepted the grant or decided to accept the grant. Um, that, was that an option? It was an option to say, okay, we do want to accept this grant because we want to become re, uh, real ID compliant. It was, was that an option? Cause, or, or could we have said, no, we don't want to. We don't need the, the real ID uh, compliance. Right. Um, sorry, I, I'm not privy to that information. I, okay. I was looking at, Jesse, he's a supervisor. Okay. Well, at the time that when we started in 2008, Marie was not the deputy director. Okay. John was not the director himself. Uh, it was previously, uh, I believe, Artie Logan at the time okay. when, when we implemented this. And uh, uh, was it an optional? Well, uh, with the administrators, they're pretty much is the one that at that time need to answer. I don't have that answer right now. So you don't know then if they decided, yes, I, I, we want to be I, real I, ID compliant. I never or... sat on the table and okay. say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Would you like this option? No, it was never. Okay. I, I, but, and I, so if it was an option, then we chose to, that option. Yeah. Um, we chose to accept the grant money. So now accepting all these federal requirements is not an option anymore, right? We have to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And I, and I guess that was another one of my concerns is, is if we don't become real ID compliant or we decide we don't want to, do we have to return that grant money? So that was part of my question too. I'd like to find that out. So I, that, that was really my question. Was so, it an option yeah. for us to decide, do we want to be real ID compliant or do we not? I, I, I guess back in, in 2008, I, I think this was an opportunity that we, we took the grant. Uh, you, we look at all the investment that we put into the department you know, two million worth and, and all these things that we're doing to improve our, our systems. We got all those cubicles, everything that we, all the computers and all the, the, the equipments that we came up all of them that, that basically that, uh, if I'm correct, from that fund. So it, it, it comes, you know, a long way. And, um, and this is really a federal law. This is as a result of 9-11, uh, right? where it was mandated, you know, by law that a real ID should be implemented, you know, at a certain time. So we took that opportunity back then to become a real ID, but again, it, it's an optional thing. So, um, you know, there's, there's an option that if, if, if you want to get your, your real ID, then you have to come up with all these, these documents, and then you will get a, a real ID driver's license or a, a Guam ID, real ID, uh, that is in compliance with the Real ID Act. So we took that opportunity to get into these things, and this is something that you know the people of Guam can benefit. Uh, as we mentioned all the benefits that we that for holding that Real ID compliant uh, ID. So uh, I, I, I believe we're we're there. We're almost there. We're about 20 more days until we become compliant, and uh, you know this is something that will benefit the people of Guam to have something for them, you know. We mentioned about real ID uh, theft that's been happening for many years. Uh, it happens even in tax. 
but um, you know, this is something that uh, it's an opportunity for, for the people who want to take advantage. So, so aside from travel then, because I can see how it could be an advantage to people who travel a lot, um, but, but there's just some people that, I mean, a, a very large population of people who never even really travel, and all they really want is a driver's license uh, to drive on the roads and not necessarily to have identification to travel abroad. So um, I'm still trying to weigh out the benefits, too, of having you know, everybody be mandated to have a real ID. Yes, you know, to add to what the director was saying, it really is a benefit to you and me because when you look about you, when you look at ID theft, it's prevalent and it's increasing. What this does is it minimizes the chance of of ID theft, and it also protects you. And that's what you want. That's what everybody wants. That's what we're leaning towards in the future. One day, this real ID will be mandatory. At least we're there already. So we're trying to move with the times and trying to keep up with the, with the um, technology and how people can easily um, create a, a fraudulent license or ID. But with this real ID, it really minimizes that. I believe it has like 13 security features on it. We also have a bio facial recognition and we've worked so hard to get to this point. And, uh, you know, I, I can't believe just dropping it right now without giving <clears throat> the citizens that benefit. And a lot of people out there are, are happy to get this kind of ID and be comforted that there's some kind of security measure taking place. We have to remember that these requirements are one time only. And, it, you know, people are confused out there because of the way we people say all the documents, but when you look at it, I can tell you three things we need. Passport, um, social security card, or W-2, so we made it even more convenient, or W-2, 1099, and a mayor certification. That is so, those are three things. So when people read all of this, they get confused. But let's simplify it. It's only three documents. It's only one-time requirement. So let's just, Keep that in mind, and it's for your protection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Okay, can okay. I add on that? We're, we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. <laughs> I'm not going to belinger this any longer. Mr. This, Chair, I, Mr. I look, Chair, I may, may I just request that the it's, procurement of the real ID, that $2 million grant, be provided to you as the chair and be yes. disseminated through the body, yes. and um, what exactly the $2 million was spent on? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to be asking the director because he would have to go back to procurement to f further back. Okay. Um, we have nobody else listed here. We'll just end the public hearing on this bill. Thank you, uh, Director, Deputy Director, Jesse, and Mr. Oka for coming by. We'll, we'll have further discussion before the bill moves any further, just to let you all know that. We will now proceed on to bill number 270. And that is an act to amend section 26403 of article 4, chapter 26, title 11, Guam code, annotated relative to restoring the liquid fuel tax rates that exist prior to enactment of public law 34-44. I've asked the following individuals that have signed in, starting with Mr. Ken, young girl, Mr. Audrey. We got Mr. Darrell Tagri, are you? Okay, not a problem. We go to Mr. Um, Ruben. Bo is he here? Ru Ruben, are you here? No, he's not here either. Um, Mr. Glenn, young girl, are you still here? I know I saw, there, sir. Have a seat. We'll begin with um, Mr. Longer. Do you have a present PowerPoint you plan on presenting? Okay, it's yeah, not, he, not going to be long, ready. right? Huh? It's not going to be long, right? Oh, no, not okay. at all. I think we're less than 300 slides. Okay, so before we start, I'm going to ask uh, the author of the bill to please uh, give his opening. And then we'll start with you, and then Audrey, and then Mr. Longer.
Sir. Uh, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for having the public hearing on Bill Number 270-34. Since the passing of Public Law 34-44, which increased the tax on liquid fuel by four cents in January of this year, coupled with rising oil prices in our region, we have seen increase after increase in the price of liquid fuel for our island and its commuters. Furthermore, since January of this year, we have seen an increase in just about every sector of our economy, from everyday commodities to utilities to food, and our people are feeling the pinch in the rise of the cost of living on Guam. I have spoken to people in our community concerned about the rapid rise in the cost of living and their inability to keep pace. That is why I introduced Bill Number 270-34 an act to repeal Public Law 34-44 to provide some relief to our overburdened community who struggle from paycheck to paycheck. This is an action-oriented response to a government that has misused the resources provided by the taxpayer. Four cents may not seem like much of a, of an, a decrease, but as my father taught me, every penny counts. I am also cognizant of the intent of Public Law 34-44, which proposed to use the proceeds of this four cent increase to fix and upgrade village roads. However, without using the revenues from the increase in liquid fuel taxes, the legislature appropriated $1.8 million from fiscal year 2018 budget, and the governor provided $2 million in federal funding specifically for road improvements. The funds appropriated to the Department of Public Works allows the agency to begin work on 19 village road improvements without using any funds collected resulting from the increase in liquid fuel taxes in January of this year. So this notion that all road improvements will stop if we repeal the liquid fuel tax is yet another fear tactic used against our people. Public Law 34-44 is a pain at the pump and represents double taxation on our people who can no longer afford to pay more taxes. This government must do all it can to collect the estimated $180 million in uncollected taxes to fund the road projects and other priorities before we run our people into the poorhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ken. Uh, with the passage of this, uh, with the fuel tax bill, uh, people are very upset, and rightfully so, because it was done in direct violation of Public Law 24.222, as was the increase in the BPT and the sales taxes. So I'm going to address my remarks to all three of these bills, all three of these issues. As a result of these tax increases, our people are rapidly becoming economic refugees. Younger people are being forced to move home with their families, and a lot of families are choosing to leave the island. First slide. What we're looking at is this rush to taxation was the equivalent of ready, fire, aim. We rushed into all these tax increases without doing due diligence, research, economic studies to find out whether or not these tax increases were merited. And in the circus that followed regarding the BP tax, the business privilege tax increase, we were looking, we learned a lot of things about the government we didn't know before. One of the most shocking things we learned is that um, $579 million, pardon me, $80 million is paid to 579 employees of government of Guam. So let's put this in perspective. We're short $67 million, yet 10% of the government of Guam budget goes to 9% of the employees of government of Guam. I find that statistic very alarming. 10% of the budget of government of Guam goes to less than 10% of the employees. So it shows that we have a lot of work that we still have to do because after this emergency was declared and we were shutting down police stations and fire stations and libraries and swimming pools because there was no money, at the same time we added six million dollars to the government of Guam payroll. So there seems to be some dis 
continuity here. Then we increased the business privilege tax to raise funds because the government was days away from laying off people and shutting down critical functions. Yet within days of approving the bill, we suddenly had $33 million to refund. Well, we haven't even collected the business privilege tax, so where did that $33 million come from? And remember, we, were being, we had guns held to our head. If we don't get this bill passed, we're going to start laying off government employees and it's going to be your fault. So you guys were held at hostage. You, you were operating without full and accurate information. So you tried to do your best for the people, but you weren't getting the full amount of information. Um, so as a result of the... Uh, Business privilege tax increase and the fuel tax increase, people are hurting, and I'm one of them because I represent a large population on Guam that lives on a fixed income, and that disposable part of our income is shrinking on a daily basis. When you look at the fuel tax increase, the utility increase, the LEAC increase, the 5% for the next 20 year increase, the threatened increases in the solid waste and all the different fee increases that are being proposed, there, there's no room left. So what we're looking at is the level of incompetence that has been dis displayed by our chief tax officer in not collecting nearly $200 million. So what we're looking at, that whole exercise we went through raising taxes and now the bills before us rolling back taxes was an exercise in futility. And it becomes apparent to me that our elected officials and appointed officials need to understand who they're dealing with. Slide two. So let's go back to basics. We have a limited population. It's 162,000 people. 28% of our population is receiving SNAP benefits. One third of our population is 50 years or older. 23% of our population is 18 years or younger. So 46% of our population is in their peak earning years right now. These are the people that are paying the taxes. So let's take a closer look at them. Next slide. We have 101,000 wage earners. Now, according to revenue tax, we have 68,000 people filing returns. The difference is that some of those people have two or three jobs. That's how we get from 68,000 individual returns to 101,000 employees. And only 13% of those wage earners are earning more than $40,000 a year. Slide four. Now when we look at the households, we have 44,662 households. And out of those households, 60% of those households, all wage earners combined, are earning less than 50,000 a year. And 34% of those households are receiving SNAP benefits. Next slide. Now, according to uh, the public broadcasting system news finance show Market Watch, in 2018, the Federal Reserve Board expressed concern that 39% of American households are forced to juggle financial obligations as they pay their bills. In other words, they can't pay all their bills in the same month. They're juggling. And that uh, millions of families are one paycheck away from being homeless. Next slide. This is the law of unintended consequences uh, running rampant through our community with the business privilege taxes, the people are suffering, and the legislature shares part of the blame for this. Put yourselves in the, mo in the shoes of people who work two or three jobs with no benefits, just to survive as it is, only to see nothing but an endless chain of dramatic increases in the cost of living across the board on fuel, food, fuel, utilities, shelter, and clothing. And 
when we look at our economy, we have had a better than 30% increase in the cost of living here on Guam, uh, driven by those taxes and utilities, import increase. Many families have now become multi-generational multi families, and we have a growing homeless population living in their car, or abandoned shacks in the village, and a growing number of them are Guam's military veterans. Next slide. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, the cost of uh, consumer price index for the year March 2017 to March 2018 was 1.4%. Well, I have my own uh, consumer price index. For the past 28 years, I make breakfast every Sunday. It is the same breakfast every Sunday. That was the gift I gave to my wife. And just in the past year, we're looking at the changes. We've seen potatoes go from 3.27 to 5.97, an 83% increase. Eggs have gone from 2.99 to 3.99, 33% increase. Cheese has gone from four and a quarter to six and a quarter, a 47% increase. Sausage has gone from 4.99 to 5.99, 20% increase. So that total Sunday breakfast in less than a year has gone from $15.50 to $22.20, a 43% increase in one year. Now, I know people that have moved back with their parents. I know people who are breaking pills in half to extend their prescriptions as they try to decide between buying food or paying utility bills. I know people driving without insurance because of the cost increases of fuel make it hard, they have a hard decision to make. Do they buy fuel? to get to work or do they pay for the insurance? We don't have a mass transit system here on Guam, so people have no choice. This body is quick to draw when it comes to raising taxes on everything for everyone. But you slam the door in the face of those people who must pay those taxes every time you vote down any change in minimum wages. We have a large service economy, as I've shown you earlier, where people are trapped in low-paying service wage jobs. And you're afraid to raise minimum wage because it's going to drive up the prices. Well, take a look at what's happening. The prices on everything have gone up dramatically. And the people in the middle are being squeezed like uh, they're in a vice. That's why we're seeing a flight of people with job skills, leaving Guam, going to places where they can get a better quality of life and a lower cost of living. So contrary to Adloop's assertion that the business privilege tax increase only adds a penny to each dollar of expenditure, I think we've seen across the board that that is not true. I mean, we have the only McDonald's in the world where the dollar menu is $1.50. Think about that for a second. And the people that eat there at McDonald's don't have the buying power that they used to have. So when they come in for the dollar meal, they're getting screwed again. So we know that when we roll back the business privilege tax, the prices aren't going to go back. We know that if we go forward with the sales tax, that's going to be another stab in the heart of the purchasing power of ordinary men and women who are struggling to keep their nose above water now. Next slide. As we see right here, the people of Guam have faced an endless onslaught of increases in the cost of living that are beyond their control. People have a choice. They can either have power or not. They could drive their car or not. These are not luxury items. It's not like we're trying to decide, do I get a uh, J.C. Penney purse or a Gucci purse. These are, the, these are life and death decisions for the quality of life of ordinary people living here on Guam. 
And as we saw, the, when the business privilege tax went from four to five, commodity prices went up anywhere between 20 and 80% across the board. The day after the business privilege tax went up, there's a snack I buy every day when I gas up. It used to be 89 cents. The day after the business privilege tax w went into effect, it's $1.99. So tell me how this one point increase in the business privilege tax, which was sold very heavily by all the minions from Adeloupe, is only going to add a penny to every dollar. 89 to $1.99, I submit, is more than a penny. Um, so not adding a sales tax at this time is crucial to the financial survival of many of Guam's families because right now the people of Guam are caught between a rock and a hard place based on the damage inflicted so far. And if you're not going to raise the minimum wage, the least you can do is give them a break today and not add the sales tax until such time as the government has done the work it should have done in the first place before raising the taxes. Now I say that based on the fact that while we were in crisis, we added six million to the payroll, we paid 33 million in refunds before we got a single penny of the tax increase, and recently we've seen where the Guam Economic Development Authority wants to give a golden parachute to a business in trouble that's about to have a building foreclosed on by the bank and is over a year behind in their lease payments. Now the building note is 1.3 million, but Gita wants to give them 4.8 million. So again, we are seeing a government that is not acting responsibly, not living within its budget. Next slide. Was that the last one? Ah, okay. I guess that was the last one. Um, so until such time as government actively takes the steps necessary to improve the income for those trapped in low wage service industry jobs living just above, at, or below the poverty level, the government is going to have to do what 60% of households do on Guam, and that is live within its means. So before you raise taxes on a population struggling to keep a roof over their head and feed their children, you guys need to do the hard work first. And that means going back, resetting the clock, eliminate the fuel tax, roll back the business privilege tax, don't implement the sales tax, and then the, the business privilege tax increase just gave the government an excuse not to do the hard work. So you guys need to force the government to do the hard work they should have done before they came to you and asked for those increases in taxes from us. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Mr. Uh, Andy. Good evening, Senators, and thank you for allowing the people to come before you tonight. Thank you. And offer their testimony on the bills being proffered, namely Bills 270 and other bills that have increased the taxes on the people of Guam. <clears throat> My name is Andre Bainham, and I come before you this evening tired, drained, and frustrated at the lack of empathy and the apparent disdain the government has shown the taxpayers of Guam, for which I wish to speak for this evening. What have we seen from this government in the past five months? Well, let me tell you. In January, this government began the assault on the taxpayers' wallets by raising the price of the liquid fuel tax to fix and repair roads, despite there already being a dedicated funding source for that very purpose. We later discovered that the money collected to fix and repair the roads, namely car registration and license fees, is currently being diverted for other purposes, uh, for other uses than its intended purpose. In February, this government continued its assault with the shock and awe campaign to get at the taxpayers' wallets. They threatened furloughs, payless paydays, and the collapse of the only public hospital in Guam if the taxes are not raised immediately. They took no responsibility and blamed the evil empire, the United States, and the Trump tax cuts for their assault on our wallets. 
even though they had ample time to make the necessary adjustments to this government to accommodate the shortfall. In March, the assault on the taxpayers' wallets entered a new, more sinister phase with operations screw the safety and security of the people by closing down police and fire stations until taxes were raised. Questions about whether this government and its uh, leaders, uh, whether its leaders are truly benevolent began to surface after the closing of the stations and the answers became apparent. This government and its leaders don't care about the people they serve. By mid-March, Operation Temper Tantrum went into effect the line of demarcation was crossed and the dear leader entered this house, the people's house, and threatened, insulted, and harangued the people's representatives, you. You were held hostage in this hall for several weeks and Operation Temper Tantrum became so overwhelming you surrendered, raised taxes, and in the end the people had to hand over their wallets and their hard-earned money to a government that is inept and derelict in its duty to put its citizens first. In April, the smoke began to clear, and the taxpayers realized we were played. You were bamboozled, hoodwinked, bola bola. And sadly, we had to deal with the higher cost of living on Guam. Since January, liquid fuel prices have increased 13%. Utility, utilities have increased by 15%. The cost of food and other commodities have seen a 0.25% increase, but it's not over. Come this October, the taxpayers of Guam are going to have to dig even deeper into their wallets and pay a 2% sales tax. Senators, when will the taxpayers who are the real casualties of this government's ineptitude get a break? Other realities surfaced as the smoke continued to clear. Just last month in May, the Office of Public Accountability reported that there were approximately $41 million in uncollected property taxes, $21 million in uncollected cigarette tax, and the Department of, Administrative Report, uh, Department of Administration reported that over $160 million in income and privilege, uh, business privilege taxes have not been collected. So I have a question. Um, do you think that just maybe this government should have collected those taxes before they began the assault on the people's wallets? By far the most egregious assault came by way of the 161 new government hires while this government was threatened, uh, while this government was threatening the health, safety and financial well-being of its citizens with Operation Temper Tantrum and Operation Screw the Safety and Security of its people. This government hired 37 people in January, 44 people in February, 10 people in March, and in April, the same month that the tax hikes, tax hikes were implemented, 70 new government employees were added to the government payroll. I have another question for this government. What are you people doing? Senators, if you think the people of Guam are made of money, I can assure you we are not. So now it's June, and we find the people present, uh, presenting a united front against this government's assault on the taxpayers' wallets by demanding that this body repeal the gas tax and repeal the 2% sales tax. You have an opportunity to help the taxpayer by putting a stop to this assault and provide some relief to an overburdened and financially drained people. And for future reference, before you plan an assault on the taxpayer, collect all unpaid taxes, stop the political hiring, and restructure this government to reflect its current financial realities. By doing so, you will inspire confidence and trust so lacking in our government today. So I encourage you to vote yes and repeal the liquid fuel tax. Vote yes on Bill 270 and repeal the 2% sales tax. And do this for the sake of the people that you swore you would serve. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Mr. Leongro. Uh, thank you, Chairman St. Augustine, Senators. 
Uh, my name is Glenn Leon Guerrero. I'm the director for Department of Public Works. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments before this committee. I'm testifying not in favor of Bill number 270-34, an act to amend uh, section 26403 of chapter 4, um, chapter 26 title 11, Guam Code annotated, relative to restoring the liquid fuel tax rates that existed prior to the enactment of public law 3444. I'd like to highlight a few uh, reasons for, my, for why Department of Public Works does not support this bill. Number one, um, the intent of Public Law 3444. The purpose of increasing the liquid fuel tax rate by four cents was to provide funding for the village road repair and construction projects. In 2010, DPW studied and developed a master plan for our village streets. The village streets master plan highlighted that Guam had about 860 miles of village streets as compared to the 155 miles of routed roads. The Village Street Master Plan assessed, evaluated, ranked our village roads and found that it cost approximately about $746 million back in 2010 to repair these facilities or those non routed roads. The Village Street Master Plan was developed as a planning document to utilize when local funds were made available. Second reason, the Village Street funding. Um, and uh, Senator Uggen pointed out that we did we did fund it, I want to, I want to say thank you. Um, Public Law 3444 DPW received funds to repair village, our village island roads from two laws in the past five years. Public Law 3253 in July 2013 appropriated $3.4 million from the Territorial Highway Fund to DPW to fund the flood mitigation projects and other purposes. One of the designated other purposes was to fund the paving of the Chalan Lamasu in Dededo. The Lamasu Road is a half mile stretch of road which connects the Ironwood development to Route 3. Um, I was told that it takes typically people within that uh, um, area roughly about half an hour just to get to Route 3 or to Iseng Song Road. So this was a, a tremendous relief for them. It took the DPW approximately four weeks to complete the project at a cost of 250000 I guess what's, in, what's relevant about that is that if we were to do a, a federal highway road uh, one mile using federal highway standards, it's about uh, roughly between five to 10 and sometimes even $15 million. Uh, EPAL road's gonna cost us 12. The construction of this new road has been, this, the construction of Lamasu, the new road, has been the genesis of my drive to ask this legislative body to provide funding so that we can continue to chip away at the over $700 million needed to repair our island roads. The second public law which addressed the village street repairs is the fiscal year 2018 Budget Act. Again, I want to thank the 34th Guam Legislature for appropriating $1,854,435 in DPW's fiscal year 2018 budget for the purpose of funding village streets and roads resurfacing and repairs. By June, by June 19 this year, in three weeks, the DPW will have completed fixing one road per village in its first round of village street repairs. These roads were initially selected by choosing one of the village mayor's top three worst roads, and the roads were chosen to fit our current budget. Governor Calvo also allocated an additional funding of $2 million from federal funds to augment DPW's ability to repair more village roads. The attached round two listing identifies that the next round of village streets at a cost of 2.5 million, and DPW is targeting the completion of round two by the end of this fiscal year, October uh, 1 or September 30th. That's what we're targeting. The third reason that we're uh, opposed to this, or not in favor of it, is that future village road improvements. As mentioned previously, Public Law 33 3444 increases the liquid fuel tax by four cents for the purpose of funding village road repairs and construction projects. The Guam Highway Fund's annual appropriation is barely enough to cover the operational expenses of DPW. Appropriations made out of the Guam Highway Fund for the purposes other than, than what the, gener the Guam Highway Fund was intended for takes away our method of addressing repairs of village streets as well as the maintenance of routed roads. Public Law 3444 was specific in that it increased the liquid fuel tax 
was solely for the village street repairs. DPW does not support uh, Bill 270-34 because it takes away the only specific designated funding source to repair our village streets. DB DPW humbly requests that the 34th Guam Legislature not only not take away the only identified funding source for our village streets. DPW suggests that the next set of next set of roads to be funded from this funding source be identified and submitted to the legislature for public hearings and for appropriation. Or another concept would be to have the DPW prepare a two-year um, plan and have the voters of Guam approve or disapprove of the listed roads in a, in a referendum. The Department of Public Works understands the burden tax increases creates that, that we understand that the, um, what these tax increases create, but unlike other tax increases, taxpayers or even increases in, 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 in the fuel, fuel costs, which have gone up, you said 12%, let's, let's be candid, it's 50 cents a gallon, it's gone up since, since uh, um, um, 60. 60 cents since, well, it depends on when you're going to start, but I'm looking at uh, November, so 60 cents, 4 cents is what I'm, what I'm, I'm, what I'm asking for. Or actually, I wasn't asking, I was asking for two million. Anyways, taxpayers don't often see or even measure the difference in which the increases affect their quality of life. In this particular case, the public can see the benefits of this four cent tax. As the end users, the public can experience this on a daily basis on their particular, in their particular vi villages. Thank you for, for your attention to this matter. Should you have any additional information, please feel free to contact me. I, 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 so I just want to say that I'm open for questions and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, sir. I'll look to my right this time. Ladies, uh, senators, anything? Senator Mike? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Languera, I understand that, um, and I think the whole island understands that we want to pay roads and you mentioned the dedicated funding source, which is the, um, the fund. But that dedicated funding source is not actually dedicated to only road, road, road repair, is that correct? We would have to have uh, the, this body approve or authorize us to use the money, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the reason I know that is because I have actually introduced a bill to actually make it a dedicated funding source so that the um, highway fund will only be used for roads because right now we cannibalize that fund for all kinds of things. And I think that's where there's a lot of um, concern about the idea of raising the liquid fuel tax and, and having the case be made that we need that for road money when the whole point of the tax prior to it being increased was that we would have road money. But instead of using that road money as a dedicated funding source, like you said, we've started using that road money for even operational expenses, personnel costs. And... Um, with the cost of living going up just across the board and with a funding source not being truly dedicated, now enjoying a, a tax increase that our people are having a very difficult time bearing, I mean, that's, I think, the whole impetus for why, I mean, that's the reason why I didn't support the increase to begin with. I think that's the reason why there's even more um, concern now to try and roll it back is because if we're really going to say that that's a priority for us, then we need to prioritize that dedicated funding source before we go out and ask for more tax dollars. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're using a dedicated funding source to subsidize a government that doesn't have its spending act in order. And so I just wanted to put that on the record because I don't want the uh, impression to be that we don't want to fix the roads. I think we do. I think that the, um, the, the clear um, understanding needs to be, are we going to do it with the money that's already in there, or are we going to continue to allow the money that's already in there to be used for other purposes and raise taxes so that we can kind of paper that, that over? And, and that's, that's kind of where I think I'm coming from with respect to considering the bill. Thank you, Mr. Leonguera. Thank you, Senator. I'll start with the... Uh Ladies, ladies, Senator Nelson, Senator Therese, do you have any questions? None? <laughs> Senator Therese? No. Sorry, 
Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Liangura, Mr. Bainham. I, I completely agree with you that we should have never raised taxes in the first place, that we should have streamlined the government. Um, so thank you for that, and we'll continue to push for the repeal of these taxes. Um, Mr. Liangura, I do have a question for you. Have you received any percentage of this four cents of liquid fuel tax since the... Uh, no, no, Senator. Uh, as Senator uh, uh, Sir Nicholas had pointed out, it, it needs to be appropriated um, by this body before we can use that, that money. Okay, that's all I have. The, excuse me. The bill was passed to collect the money, but you can't get it unless it's appropriated? Is that what you're saying? The, the bill was passed. It started, we started collecting since January of this year. Um, that money still is, goes to the liquid fuel tax fund and, and I cannot, there is no authorization for me to use that money. I, the authorization has to come from you, sir. And how much money is, is in there in that account? Are you aware? I'm, I'm not sure the, the estimates that BBMR gave me for uh, on an annual basis is about 3.5 million. J okay. Just to be okay. clear, the authorization doesn't have to come from us. The governor it, does have the authority to no. transfer the fund? No, it does no. not. Okay. Okay. So that's a good back and count then. Senator, no. Senator Chalai. Mr. Chair, I don't remember the number right now, but there is a bill that I had introduced that, that would do that, what, that would take that the f additional four cents that is being collected and appropriated and restricted for village street roads only. Yes. And, um, but that bill is still pending in a committee. Um, and I think when we had the budget hearing for DPW, DPW had, had asked the same thing, that that money, if it's appropriated right now, since it's being collected already, it could go to the streets instead of being um, just sitting there collecting. That's correct. All right. And um, I just want to go over, when this... When this uh, liquid fuels tax increase was passed, of course, um, none of these other tax increases were being contemplated at that time. And, um, and I just want to review your testimony where you say that, um, and, and there was an earlier comment that you've already completed 19 roads and uh, so why do you, we need to give you, and that you plan to do round two, which would do another approximately 19 roads, and, and these are all village, village roads off of the village street master plan, right? And this actually is only, um, what percentage of the, in your testimony you, you laid it out here, if I just, you said the village street master plan is require um, kind of assessed all the village roads, which ones needs repair, and you you pointed out 860 miles of village streets, and that it would cost 746 million dollars. So, how many of the 866? I mean, sorry, 860 miles of village streets that need to be repaired have actually been repaired in round one. Two miles. Pardon. Roughly two miles. And, and how many do you estimate to be repaired in round two? Um, roughly a, a, another two miles. Four miles out of 860 miles that need to be repaired. That's right. And um, we're, we're, we're repairing roads at, a, again, roughly about um, half a million dollars per mile. So some of the, uh, since they're 19 villages, they're not a mile, they're right. just small sections, they're small areas, other roads. Mm -hmm. At the last budget hearing, you asked about, um, about uh, Snake Road, and that's um, about a 1.7, 1.8 mile stretch of road. So that'll cost roughly about $700,000 All right. Using, using our estimates. And so when this bill was originally passed, the, the estimate that was that raising the um, tax by 0 0.04 or four cents for every gallon would um, cost? 
somebody like me going to get gas, if I got 16 gallons when I fill it up, it would be, uh, and I did that every single week, I would pay $33 total for the year additional. The problem is that since this bill was passed, tax prices have increased not by the four cents per gallon, they've increased by approximately 60 cents per gallon, which if I fill up 16 gallons times 52 weeks, if I'm calculating it right, comes out to like $499 versus the $333 that, that the tax increase cost. So, so if you take your math, uh, Vice Speaker, $493 that you're going to spend, and you take away 33 from that, you're, you're still going to spend 460 some dollars a year because those increases are, are the cost of what it costs for commodity. It's, uh, so we're saying that repealing this tax at this point, we're still going to end up paying an additional $490, sure. $460. 460 you take this tax yes. off. Yes, yeah. Um, Actually, the Senator, there's a, uh, an effect that's not being recognized. Because of the increases in the gas prices, people are buying less gas. I'm a perfect example. I now have cut down dramatically on my driving. Instead of coming to town every day like I used to, you guys remember, I used to be here a lot. Now I come to town maybe two or three times a week. So that's a dramatic reduction in the amount of gas I'm buying, which means that we're not getting the kind of numbers uh, going to the fund that were originally forecast. And I'm not alone. I know a lot of other people that have re dramatically reduced their driving. Now yes, remember, it's per prices. gallon. I agree that gas prices have absolutely impacted everybody's driving, right? I don't stroll like we used to down south or things like that as much as we would like. But what about, um, but I'm just pointing out that the $33 estimate in our example that we are paying for the tax to repair roads is, is so small compared to the gas company's increase in pricing to an additional $460. If I and I, yeah, and I don't know the solution, and I know that my colleagues have, have you know, attempted to pursue this in very many ways uh, to get more competition with gas, but I think, yeah, that's probably for another hearing on uh, Senator, gas prices I, in general. If I could, yes. you're, 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 you're right in the ballpark because the four cent increase is not just for the gas alone, but in order for the gas stations to operate. So that four cents and the extra money that they pay, that they have to pay out, also, also um, impacts the, 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 the other services that they provide within that station. And I spoke with some people in the gas industry and, and, and they kind of explained to me that whenever you increase gas, you're not just increasing it by a cent or a percentage for just the liquid, you're increasing the other services that, that, is, that the gas station provides as well. So they add that on to the gas. So that's just from Senator, my basic that understanding. That doesn't make any sense. I come from you know what oil. you may not you may not think so, but I, this is the information that I've spoken to with the gas company. I come so from the oil industry. This is just what I got. So. Okay, right. okay. This, I have this, over this, four, twenty this, years of, of okay. Uh, of I, I understand where you okay. both you gentlemen it's come from. True. I'll I'll ask that question to be checked out because that just don't sound right. If if if, if the agency if the I understand your comment, Andre, but we'll, we'll look into that. Senator right. Turley. Yeah, so finally, yes. Yeah, so even if we did continue with this four cents per gallon and the current, appro let's say the current appropriation level, the amount of money that you're getting to repair roads. Uh, so if we went status quo and we, sorry, let me just go back. If we repealed the, this um, four cents, we remain status quo. Next year, you would only be able to fund, I mean, an additional perhaps. 19 roads, not two miles. I, I, don't, I, I don't know, Senator, and the reason why I say that is, is when I was here at the last budget hearing, I said that, that I, I refuse to, to, to go on government as usual. If, if I 
as, and every year I, I, I experience lapses. And because I've experienced the lapse, I don't want it to, to go so at the end of this budget cycle, then I lose it. So oh. I would use that money. You've been able to use savings and I, Mr. Elsewhere Chairman, if, if I may, Madam Vice Speaker, because can you please provide the correct figure of where your, the $3.8 million originated for this year's Sorry? Uh, roadmap, road repairs. Can you please ensure that you provide the correct financial information of where the $3.8 million originated for, for the repair of roads for the, that is presently Yeah, I did. I, in my testimony, I said 1.8 yes. came from, from, my, from my budget. And again, I thank you for that. And then another two million came from the governor from DOI Compact funds impact. or something right. to that effect. So uh, 1.85 million, right? But the, this fund potentially, with the three million, um, are, do you have the capability, if you received that three million today, to to do additional road repairs? Yes, yes, we do. Um, if if we go higher than that, I, I wouldn't. And you know, can I? Just for, for total um, uh, transparency, and I probably shouldn't say stuff like this, but I only asked for one or two million dollars. I, I just wanted to, to continue to do roads, and it didn't want to affect, um, uh, I understand your responsibilities. Your responsibilities is you're weighing health and education and safety and all that other stuff. All I wanted to do is to say, give me some money on a regular basis so that we can chip away at this $860 million um, mammoth. Uh, uh, 860 miles of village streets. Yes. On, according to the village streets master plan. Now this is not even talking about um, routed roads or the highways, right? Those are, we're talking about a that, totally that, different funding sources. That's correct. All right, okay, thank you, thank you. Senator Stavis, do you have anything? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a couple of things and with regards, you know, a lot of information was put out with, with regard to, um, I guess, previous roundtables and discussions we've had with requirements to the needs for the uh, Department of Public Works. Um, if we can go back to, I asked you a pointed question and I ask you this quite often. How much would DPW need to purchase the asphalt, not talking about personnel, to purchase the asphalt in order to ensure that your road crews are working on roads almost every, or on about every single day, as long, if they're not on holiday, and to continuously work on roads year in, year out? That, that's a very good question, um, and I, don't, I can get the answer to, to you, sir. Um, but just to, to frame, because I want to manage your expectation as well. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there's only one supplier today, um, Hawaiian Rock. We've been trying to court ne ne Nepo to actually turn on their, their uh, to fire up their, their plants. Um, for whatever reason, they're not, they're not, they have their equipment and they're not engaging. Um, this is a business for them. They, they don't turn on their plants every day. They turn it on when there's sufficient uh, um, um, work for them to make a profit. And, and so um, that's why our roads are not fixed every day or every other day. Or when we're, when we're ready for them, we have to wait for their scheduling. I, I think you highlight a couple of things. And I remember that number. I think the number back then was about a year ago was uh, 10 million. 10 million is what you would need to be able to be, have your road crews Thank you. working on roads year round. Um, but you know, to highlight what you were saying, I do understand, right? To operate that plant, it's a cost to the business. And let's let's be frank here: Gov, Gov, Gov Guam's not going to pay them in a timely fashion, so that's a loss for that business until they actually get paid. And so, if there isn't uh, if, if if there isn't a more robust, dedicated funding source uh, for the roads, that's not that's not any incentive for the business. And therefore, I think you're running into the issue where now you have a sole source. Uh, for the asphalt and now there is no competition. So that price could potentially go up. Am I, am I correct? Is that, is that a concern? Um, it is, it is and that's like I said why we wanted to, to engage NEPO to come in and, and, and uh, participate in our construction. And so I, th you know, I think there, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's probably an added benefit to having that money in that account 
dedicated for roads and so that when you're working with these businesses at least you're getting a competitive price and they know that you have the money to pay them if they're going to turn on their plan and start running the asphalt is is, is that kind of along the lines of because that that's that's along the lines of what i was thinking uh, with the initial onset of the bill and the liquid fuel tax i think another concern i had is that you know we have certified trained uh road repair individuals that's our specialty in Department of Public Works. We have equipment that's ready to do this work and the personnel to man it, and what we just don't have now is the asphalt to do it. And so now we have government employees not doing what they're trained to do, equipment sitting around not doing what they're, they're ready to do. Am I correct? No, that's not correct. Oh, so, so what are they doing if they're not working on roads? Um, they're, they're always working on the roads. If it's not fixing roads for road repair, they're working on, like today, we, we pulled them off. They can't paint, they can't do road repairs, but they're doing flood mitigation. And it's the same group of people that it does that. And we have uh, uh, numerous places. Um, of the, the 19 that we're gonna finish by the end of two weeks, or, or two, two weeks from now, or three weeks from now, um, seven of them are on streets that, that we, you can talk to the, the residents. I, I've seen them, the flood mitigation, so heavy rains are out there putting sandbags with heavy equipment, Ab rain or shine, correct? And it's not safe for And for are vehicles. these individuals funded with the, with the funding source of the, the road re repair fund, with the surcharge? No, is no. They're, they're, the, the road repair fund that I'm asking for is just basically to cover that, the payment I, costs. I understand. I'm just talking about the fund itself. The special fund itself, it's already been addressed, right. that you use it on personnel. I'm just asking what personnel do you use it on? My, my personnel is a sunk cost, sir. And, and whether we use it to repair roads or to do flood mitigation, it's a sunk cost. That's what we pay our, 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 our annual salaries. So, so um, if I were to use some of this money um, from, from um, uh, the liquid fuel tax, it would be for their overtime, yeah. if for something that we need to do on, on an emergency type basis. But um, typically that money goes straight to... Um, to oh, you're, but we're talking about the poor... Uh, the the point zero four right now that goes sh directly correct to village streets correct and and again what I'm just speaking to is I guess the all, overall um, uh, I guess misconception or or preconceived notions on what the liquid fuel tax actually goes to and is there and that added benefit to the people of Guam I mean because I think we we all kind of have heard um, the complaints and the concerns about our road and just to be very clear on the on the public record that this increases directly for village streets. Well, that, that's what it's intended. Yes. And, and, and what, we, what we proffered was, I, I've given you a, 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 our, 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 our desire, three, three of the worst roads from the mayors and three from, of the worst roads from the village street master plan. That combined total is about $70 million. Um, so that's for a total of six roads, $70 million. And, 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 and I was, again, uh, I'm, all I'm asking is that we continue to, to address these roads and, and, and uh, I'd be happy you tell me which road you want me to fix. To me, that doesn't matter. What matters to me is that, that we, you give us the ability to, to, to keep, um, continue my guys uh, 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 to be productive and, and to, to address the, the serious roads that, that, that do cause our, our, uh, our residents uh, poor quality of life, danger in, in driving, etc. So, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Leonguro. Thank you, and Senator Ogan, and then you'd be able to close up. Close thank you very much, uh, Mr. You. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leonguro, first of all, I mean, any time that these statements are made to try to uh, defeat taking money out of our people's pockets without at least doing our part is, is certainly a, a concern that I have. Um, also, my question to you is, how many of the 19 village roads that you have identified have you, are completed as of today? Fourteen. Thank you. And, and just looking at what's already being generated as of the end of last month would be approximately $1.4, $1.5 million that would be deposited into that account for DPW to use for roads. But in my case, it's 
looking at how the funds, the Guam Highway funds are being utilized, 60 to 70 percent of the Guam Highway funds is allocated to DPW is specifically used for personnel. Yes, or higher, yes. Because over the course of the years, DPW, and it's partly under your reign, but over the course of the years, there's been transference of personnel from general fund obligation to Guam Highway fund obligation under this particular division. So if you take a look at the number of personnel under the Guam Highway division funded by the Guam Highway fund, you will look, see that 11, 12 years ago, the number of personnel have increased in percentage. So that's got to stop. Because if you want more money that's already being allocated to DPW for the repair of roads, then we need to look inside first. Uh, and absolutely. if people retire, retire, then by all means, we need to provide those resources. Uh, Secondly, um, I just want to perhaps regurgitate some of the numbers that have been provided. Since November, per gallon has increased approximately 60 cents. And that was shared with us a little earlier. 27 gallon vehicle, once a week, it's approximately $842. Coming out just since November, when the cost of liquid fuel increased. So that means our people are not no longer taking, perhaps going to the beach with their family members. That means our people have to live within their means. That means our people have to ensure that they reallocate the limited resources that they have. And I'm bringing this up because we as a government have to do the same. We have to take ownership of this entire process and streamline services and ensure that we more effectively and efficiently allocate these resources. And let me close with this, uh, Mr. Chairman, because even if you're looking at numbers, at four cents a gallon, since the 60 cents uh, cost, it's about $50 a year. That's $50 a year that a parent can purchase something, a shoe clothing for their children. So let's not uh, try to minimize the money that this government has taken away from the pocketbooks of our people. We need to repeal this and we need to ensure that our government lives within its means. If the governor of Guam was able to identify $2 million in federal funds, then for the subsequent fiscal year, we need to push for identification of $2 million from another funding source or from the federal funds so that in fact you continue the repair of our secondary and tertiary roads because our people need the roads repaired but not at the expense of their pocketbooks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, Can I Madam please Vice. ask the director, can we use federal highway funds on these village roads? Uh, not federal highway funds, no. Thank you. Okay, thank you.